Thanks to Skillshare for supporting this episode of SciShow Space. The first 1,000 people to click the link in the description can get a free trial of Skillshare's premium membership. It's August 7th, 1971, and the Apollo 15 astronauts are on their way home. They've entered the atmosphere, fired their control thrusters, and the parachutes have just deployed. And then Mission Control tells them to, quote, stand by for a hard impact. This is not what you want to hear when you are on your way home from the moon. You want everything optimal. Things were not optimal. It turns out one of their three parachutes didn't inflate. Fortunately, the other two did inflate, and they slowed them down enough that everyone was fine. But almost 50 years later in 2019, both SpaceX and Boeing ran into similar problems. SpaceX had three out of four parachutes on a Dragon capsule fail to inflate, and Boeing had a chute that just didn't deploy at all. Parachutes? have one job. Why can't we get them to do it? Well, it turns out parachutes are super hard. They're such a complex, dynamic physical system that it's difficult to predict whether they will inflate at all, let alone whether they can stand up to the forces they experience when they work. That's why we're still trying to understand them more than 500 years after they were invented. So when we think of parachutes, we usually think of basically a half balloon shape. But when Leonardo da Vinci first drew his parachute design in the 1480s, it was a pyramid, and shapes more similar to hang gliders started showing up around 1615. These designs were all very academic, with maybe a little bit of testing but no real development or interest. Likely because we, you know, couldn't get up very high. Well, that changed in the late 1700s when hot air balloons were developed. The first recorded human jump happened in 1783 from the top of an observatory using a parachute with an internal frame, so basically a big umbrella. By the early 1800s, engineers had gotten rid of the frame at the top, and they also added a vent. Now, it might not intuitively make sense to put a hole in the thing that is meant to catch all of the air, but the vent was actually crucial. Without it, there was so much turbulence that the parachuters were just whipped around in the air. The vent reduced that turbulence and allowed parachuters to land safely and presumably without throwing up all over the spectators. That design from the early 1800s is basically what we still use, a frameless balloon shape with some venting for stability. But how we use parachutes has changed a lot. They are not just for landing humans anymore, we are also using them for landing huge machines. In fact, the first use of a parachute with a machine was for a race car. And while that was testing a design meant for for humans, it eventually became clear that the right size chute could slow even bigger machines, and from there it was a hop, skip, and a jump to spacecraft. So let's talk about that application specifically, because this is where things get sticky. To land a big machine, you need a big parachute. Parachutes work by catching air as they descend, and the pressure from the air creates a force distribution called load. Load is a function of surface area. That means a big parachute carrying a big spacecraft could catch a lot of force when it deploys, maybe more than it can handle. So to get around this, engineers use a dual deployment system consisting of a drogue chute and a main chute. Drogues have a smaller area so they can slow down the craft enough that the main chutes can deploy, and they have other benefits as well. A dual deployment system is what we've been using basically the whole time we've been going to space. It's very effective when everything goes to plan. But things frequently do not go to plan, which brings us back to SpaceX and Boeing's parachute-related setbacks. Part of the issue is that when launching things into space, we want them to be as light as possible. So we've been introducing lighter materials, but we need to test those materials, and part of how we do that is through models. This, though, presents a couple challenges. One is that it is super hard to model parachutes. Air behavior can change super fast as you move through the atmosphere, and turbulence is extremely hard for computers to model. So any model we're working with isn't going to be very precise. Another thing is that the assumptions that everyone has been using to make their models have been wrong for, like, a long time. Specifically, they were wrong about how much load the lines that connect the chutes to the spacecraft would experience. These assumptions are based on data from the parachutes used in the Apollo missions, and the mistakes just happened to cancel out, or at least they got close enough. But when using the same assumptions with different materials, you get something called asymmetrical load distribution. Basically, the parachute experiences different amounts of force over its area so that it can't really inflate, 
which is bad. So both our models and our parachutes need to be updated and improved, and some of the ways engineers are doing that are pretty neat. One line of investigation looks at reefing, where specific parachute lines that hold the chute closed are strategically cut in order to control the rate of inflation. Boeing's parachutes now use extra strong reefing lines so that they don't snap too early, and NASA engineers have developed high-precision accelerometers that can measure the rate of inflation and be used to test new reefing systems. Meanwhile, space SpaceX is starting to use a material called xylon, which is basically super nylon, and a new stitching pattern that reinforces areas of the parachute expected to get the highest load. So they're basically assuming that asymmetrical loading is going to happen, and then working around it. Meanwhile, computer scientists are developing models to understand how fabric behaves on the micro scale. That information could be used to understand how and why parachutes fail, and for developing or modifying synthetic fabrics to get a fabric that is extra strong and extra light. So even though we're still working with the same basic plan as we used in the 1800s, it turns out there is still some work to do to bring parachute technology into the 21st century. If you enjoyed learning about parachutes, you might want to take a dive over to Skillshare, where people learn about all sorts of fascinating things, from physics and astronomy to painting the night sky. Skillshare is an online community curated specifically for learning. If you'd like to keep your feet on the ground rather than falling from the sky, you might enjoy indoor gardening grow houseplants, veggies, and herbs with Ekta Chaudhry. And there are tons of other courses, too. The first thousand people to click the link in the description can get a one-month free trial of a Skillshare Premium membership. And thank you for your support.